can't be looking towards the past and it can only be looking towards the future with the exception of wills and I guess testamentary capacity and I would say A. You say A? I don't know because that sounds to me like an expert opinion. Well, he's describing the decedent. Yeah, I guess. I mean, senility is. Is that a layperson's. Can a layperson diagnose that? I don't know. You want to go? Sense impression. So let's go through B. Uh, so you would say. I don't think that makes sense. B doesn't. Would you agree B doesn't make sense? or Maybe it does. So B says the defense objection should be sustained because the neighbor has not been qualified as an expert. Yeah, I just. I mean, it makes sense. They're saying that hey, we can't, you can't let that in. He's not an expert. Oh wait, I, I misread this question. So it says the defense objects. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the defense is actually, you know what? I'm gonna go with. Uh, C. I'm going to go with C. Because this is a proper opinion testimony. I think it comes down to B or C. Yeah. I'm going to so go with C. Do you think he can, a lay person can testify that? Yeah. Do you want me to yeah, look at it? Okay. C. Okay, it's C. The object should be overruled. The objection should be overruled because the neighbor's testimony is proper opinion testimony. Although opinions by lay witnesses are generally inadmissible, they adm they may be admitted when an event is likely to be perceived as a whole impression rather than more specific components. Under the federal rules, lay opinion testimony is admissible when one, it is rationally based on the perception of the witness; two, it is helpful to clear understanding of her testimony or to the determination of fact and issue; and three. It is not based in scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. Federal Rule of Evidence 701. So now let's let's say that hypo said the neighbor states that the descent that the decedent suffered from Alzheimer's. That'd probably be an expert testimony, and I guess I would go with B. Yeah. All right. Alrighty. Next one. Tricky business. Thirteen? Yep. I'd say D. This is rape shield. Yeah, but it's saying which one would come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'd go with D. Because yeah, one of those, shield, it's those three exceptions. Yeah, there was prior consensual sex between the defendant and the victim. That's one exception, right? Yeah, I just looked at the answer. It's a, it's a D. Okay. Yeah, I'd go with that. All right. Uh, evidence of prior consensual se sexual relations can't between the director and the worker is most likely admissible, although Federal Rule 412 generally excludes evidence of an alleged victim's sexual behavior. Evidence or specific of specific instances of sexual conduct between the alleged victim and the accused may be admitted to show consent. Thus, if the director raises the consent to, uh, as a defense to the rape charge evidence, the previous consensual encounters with, with the worker is admissible. All right, let's go to the next one. I think we're going more quickly now that we're... Yeah, I think yeah. so too. I think this is more beneficial.
thing is B. Yeah, because bias is never collateral. It's always um, probative. It's it's one of the main purposes for impeachment. All right, let me go to the next one. Yep, B. Prosecution question is aimed at discovering bias, which tends to show the witness had a motive to lie. Impeachment involves casting of an adverse reflection of the veracity of the witness, and it may take several forms. Evidence that a witness is biased tends to show that she has a motive to lie, and thus well-recognized method of impeachment. Inferences of bias may be shown by evidence of family or the relationship. Here, the prosecutor is attempting to show that due to family relationship, or friendship of the defendant's wife that a witness may be biased and would thus have a uh, motive to lie on behalf of the defendant. All right. Here, there's something in bold down here. While any material evidence introduced by a party will probably be prejudicial to the adverse party's case, it is only on fair prejudice that may be excluded. Oh, okay. All right. So unfair prejudice would be excluded, but yeah, yeah all right. Yeah, What's the rest of do you say? Really? What do you think? Yeah, I was thinking of B of, or D. I don't, I don't know. No. Yeah, I guess. Yep, it's B. The court should rule for the state because the defendant did not testify and is charged with a crime of violence. His character and honesty or veracity are, is not an issue at issue, and the proffered evidence is irrelevant. That was a pretty short answer. All right, so I guess it was pretty straightforward. Can you read that up there? Yeah. Over 10 years? Yeah. Let me check. Yep, A. The objection to the perjury question is the most likely to be sustained. Federal Rule 609 permits the prosecution to inquire to prior conviction crimes regarding re requiring proof of admission or dishonesty, false statement, unless over 10 years have passed since the day conviction or release from the confinement. While the facts do not indicate the later date or even whether confinement occurred, it reminds the best of the four choices.
So, the truth being asserted is... The matter asserted the matter. is that he, uh, he threatened to come after him unless he testified falsely. And, and it's offered to prove that he was at the short distance from the... And it's offered to prove... I think it's hearsay. I just think it, it's the declaration against interest. I was thinking it's not hearsay, though, because I don't see what it's... You know what I mean? I think they're different. Notice, because... He was standing a short distance away, further testifies that the ambulance was leaving with plaintiff, defendant. It's, yeah, I, th I see those as two different things. So it's not all, you're saying it's not offered for its truth, it's offered to show, it's offered for what? I think it's just offered to show that. Um, the defendant threatened to come after him unless he testified falsely, which is different from being there at the scene. So... So you think it's A? A or C. You said it was hearsay, though, right? Yeah. No, no, I said it was not. Oh, wait, wait, wait. it's hearsay now. Uh, yeah, I mean... I know I said it's not hearsay because they're not the two the same things. So. Oh, okay. You said it's not hearsay, so... Yeah. Can't be it. Yeah. And then, no, it's not relevant to the issue of negligence. Yeah. It could be. Do you want me to look? I'm sticking with D. Yeah, I would say, yeah, well, I'm going to go with C and then it'll okay. come down. Okay. 17 is C. An admission. Hey. Is what it is, I guess I don't know. An admission is a statement made or an act done. The amount, the prior knowledge of the parties, as of the relevant facts, or his kinds of conduct, including attempts to threaten the witness, may be hold to manifest awareness of liability or guilt. Defendant's attempt to threaten the witness would be considered an admission under the federal rules. Admissions is not considered hearsay. An admission? Interesting. I didn't pick up the defendant's attempt would be considered an admission. Alternatively, the defendant's conduct could be classified as conduct not intended as an assertion. Is that what they said? Yeah, I think there's two like ways it's not hearsay. Mm -hmm. Such conduct is not considered as hearsay under the rules. Thus, A is wrong, B is wrong. Evidence helps establish the defendant believed that he acted negligently. D is wrong. Because the admissions are not hearsay, the evidence would not come in to, under an exception rule. Also, declarations of interest can only be used when the declarant is unavailable. Yeah, so he isn't available. That's, that's, that's it. That. On, that's no, no worries, man. So remember, but like the difference between a statement of a party opponent, it doesn't it doesn't matter if they're uh, available or not. Availability is immaterial, and it can be for self-serving purpose. All right, so we're going with the next one. I think this is a relevancy question. You think so? Nope. But there's no remedial measures. I think it is relevant, so not A. I don't think it's B because there's no mention of remedial measures. Well, I guess wait, there. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were. There were. There were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. New hiring procedures for all potential employees. Uh, yeah, I think I'd go with. Would you say B? B? Yeah. I'll check. No, the other one makes sense to me. Uh, let's see. Really? I guess that would have been my second choice, but. Is evidence of the hotel admissible? The evidence is admissible because it tends to show that the hotel was not acting prudently when it hired the valet. An, em an employee who damaged guest car. B is not a good answer because only subsequent remedial. Only because only subsequent remedial measures may not be proven as evidence of negligence. Here, change in hiring procedures took before the car was damaged, so it would be allowed. D is not accurate. The evidence does not show that the valet was incompetent, rather that the hotel did not investigate his competence when he was hired. That's bad on our part. Yeah. Because the evidence was that six months before the accident. Yeah. So you were right. It wasn't a subsequent remedial measure. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. It was a previous remedial measure. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, it was a previous. So, yeah, I think that's something to watch out for. As soon as I saw. Yeah. I just, I agree. The pre remedial measures? Uh, that's what we're going to call it. Well, as soon as I saw that there was a change to their process, I was like, oh, all right, skip down, skip down. All right, that's it for those. We didn't do very good. Right. <laughs> I think we did better on the second ten, on the second eight. Yeah. Go to the next ones. Oh, yeah. Well, let's get to it. I think this is kind of better than the Q and A's. Yeah. I, I barely got to the E and E for evidence. It's just tough. What do you mean? I have it. It's just I mean I checked it out from the library, but it's just tough. It's dense. It's a lot of information. I think the thing is, it's probably one of the best ones. So it really teaches you everything. All right, hold up. Let me just get where you need me for the answers. Okay. I would say. Let me let me read it real fast. Okay. Uh, see, because I think, yeah. It's prior and consistent statement, right? So I think it's for impeachment and subsequent, subsequent, uh, and at yeah, I think it comes in for both, but you could ask for a limited instruction, maybe. Definitely, I think. All right. All right. 
Let's see. The grand jury statement, it, it, we got it right. The grand jury statement is admissible both as impeachment evidence and substantive evidence. A prior and consistent made statement made under oath at a prior proceeding or deposition is admissible non-hearsay and thus may be used as substantive evidence as well as for impeachment. The credibility of a witness may be impeached by showing that the witness has other occasion made statements that are inconsistent with some material part of the present testimony because it is made by the declarant other than while well, testifying at trial or hearing. A prior and consistent statement will usually constitute hearsay if offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted therein. Under such circumstances, the statement would be admissible only to impeach the witness. However, where the statement was made under oath at a prior proceeding, including grand jury proceeding, it is admissible non-hearsay, uh, and i.e., it may be considered for substantive proof of the facts stated. The witness's sworn statement before the grand jury that the defendant was driving normally at the time of the accident is inconsistent with his l later in court testimony that it was the defendant on the wrong side of the highway at the time of the collision. Thus, the statement can be inquired into to the defendant to cast out on whether on the on the witness's credibility because the statement was made in the prior proceeding and was made under oath. It is non hearsay and also admissible as substantive proof that the defendant of the fact was driving normally at the time of the accident. Also, I think this is interesting to note because. Remember, if it's at a proceeding or court, it's not an out-of-court statement. Right. Yeah. This, those are some trick questions, I think, that she can get us on. I mean, that's all right, but we just need to watch out for it. And, and I asked her, actually, about it. I said, you're going to put trick questions on there, aren't you? And she said, me? Never. <laughs> there will be. There will be. This one's tough. Hmm. Do you want to go why some might be wrong? Well, I, don't I don't think it's you. <laughs> I don't think I know the answer to this one. I can tell you what I. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, go ahead and talk through it. Oh, you want me to talk through it? I'm going to thank for this one moment. Yeah. I don't think it's admissible. I think it's inadmissible here, sir. I think it's deep. Why? Because even though it was made in a prior proceeding, the defendant did not have an opportunity to cross. And now that the and now that the witness is unavailable, you have confrontation clause problems. But this is a civil case, isn't it? Is this a civil case? No, it's felony. Okay. So you, you would have confrontation. Yeah. So you're going to go with D? It depends whether or not grand jury testimony is considered... Former testimony? Yeah. It is. Even though there's no opportunity to cross it down. Yeah. Well, I'll go to the answer. Yes, <laughs> D. Yep, it is deep. 
The transcript of the first witness of grand jury testimony is inadmissible hearsay. Hearsay is a statement other than one made by the declarant while testifying uh, at trial or hearing offered in evidence to prove the truth of the matter asserted. A hearsay statement to which the exception to hearsay rule is applicable must be excluded on appropriate objection. The transcript of the grand jury testimony is being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted therein. The grand jury testimony of a person who is now testifying is deemed neither non-hearsay nor within any recognized hearsay rule. Okay. I guess it's not a prior proceeding. I think it is in some circumstances. Okay, that's nice to hear. <laughs> well, when would it be a prior proceeding? Good like if it was a if it was a prior inconsistent statement and the witness was available, but since he's unavailable, I think that's the kicker. Yeah. If he was available. You could Does former it. testimony require unavailability? No, I'm saying that's the Crawford problem here. Is that he's unavailable? If he was still available, you could use his. You could use his whatever his statement was from the grand jury proceeding, like if you were trying to show a prior inconsistent statement or something like that. Oh, if he's unavailable. You can't use okay, his, yeah. his prior statement from a grand jury proceeding because he wasn't subject to cross. Right, right. So here's what I have: statement made in a proceeding question mark. Grand jury proceeding qualifies, although a uh, person is not cross-examinable at the time of the grand jury proceeding. He is cross-examinable now. This was like a no hypo. Problem. Yeah, yeah. Now. So, it's a statement is yeah. This is in regards to inconsistency. Okay, so if he was cross-examinable now, it would be admissible under former testimony exception because it was at a prior proceeding and he is available and he has personal knowledge therein. Okay. Go. What's the former testimony exception? Is that do right, you want me to find the elements? Yeah. Okay. Is that an A one or three exception? Eight oh four B one. So that's an unavailable witness. So two requirements, only need the opportunity to cross-examine and there has been a similar motive to cross-examine in the previous hearing. So it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be former testimony exception. Because there was no, no opportunity. Or, yeah. We also need motives. So even if there was an opportunity, there could have been uh, a motive. She gave me a hypo that was kind of on the fence. She said a uh, husband and wife were defendants in a case uh, for murder. So they were, I guess... To conspiracy for murder, two, two people murdering, and then she's tried again because they get new evidence or there was a mistrial or something. The court in that case said that she had a motive to cross-examine her husband because she was trying to prove her innocence, but Seymour said it, could, it was probably on the fence because maybe she didn't want to get her husband. So you see what I'm saying? But, you see, you, so you, you, but another example is there is a bus crash, right? And the bus crash first starts with a civil trial. Uh, you had an opportunity to examine, I guess, the bus driver or, or relevant witnesses. And then you have uh, a... And then you have a criminal trial. You can bring those in because it was a prior proceeding and you had a motive, as long as there was a motive to. And in a civil case, if the second case was a civil case, yeah. you could do it with a predecessor in interest. Okay. But oh, not yeah. With, not in a criminal case, if the second case is a criminal case. Okay, okay. I think that makes better sense now. That's good. So you basically have to have. No, you, it doesn't matter. It, like, availability is a material for former testimony. As long as you former had... testimony, the witness has to be unavailable. Okay. But, since it was made in a prior proceeding, 
where the where the witness was subject to cross by the defendant or in a civil case by the defendant's predecessor in interest mm -hmm. is admissible as an exception. To the right. Case. Right. Are we on two? Let's do it. We just did it. Uh -huh, we just did it. Sounds good.